Good morning, good morning. I'm Sean Mountcastle. I'm the youth intern here at FCC. Um, if this is your first time here, welcome. Um, if you're wanting to connect with the church or reach out or the church reach out, these connect cards that you can find in the um, pews. Also, if you didn't, grab your communion cups. Um, now is the time to do so, or if not, you can raise your hand and somebody will bring it to you. Um, so if you can, please stand. And Jonathan Jackson, would you like to do scripture reading? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be reading uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'll pray and we'll start. Just dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for each and every blessing. Just uh, thank you for allowing us to gather here in your house today. Uh, just uh, lift up Ben today as he brings your word to us. Uh, just pray, Lord, that uh, we can all just... Uh, Allow your Holy Spirit to work in our lives and just lead us and guide us and direct us uh, that uh, his will might be done in our lives. And just uh, pray all these things, Lord, be your will. Amen. Are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's no.
shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and i will You may be seated. Good morning. I had forgotten it was Family Sunday, and I'm so glad it is because um, these are my people. This is who I feel comfortable with. I'm used to nine and ten year olds, so I'm so glad that um, the kids are with us this morning. So as I was thinking about a communion thought, um, I went by, I, there's a, a verse I'm going to come to in a little bit that kind of ties all this together, but um, I want to start off by talking about, about 16 years ago, um, Jody and I entered a new chapter of, in our life, parenting. And uh, we had this sweet little baby, and um, she was such a good baby. Good sleeper, smiled. We were so blessed to have just a sweet, sweet baby. A um, couple years went by, and we hit the twos. And that sweet baby turned into a baby who was laying in the aisle of Kmart toys, um, pitching a fit. I'm sure she's glad I'm sharing that with you all. But as you all, parents know, that's what happens. We go from this, this sweet, tiny baby to this creature that <laughs> has this attitude of its own. Um, and at that point, we realized that we needed to learn a little bit about disciplining children because we were, you know, just young adults and we didn't have any of that in our, uh, in our repertoire of um, skills and abilities. So we reached out and we thought back to how we were raised and how we were disciplined as children. Um, as a parent, discipline's not fun. And I know sometimes you think your parents might enjoy disciplining you. I promise they don't. Um, it's hard. It's hard to discipline your child. And there would be times that I wouldn't want to cave in, and I would want to say, you know, it's okay. It's all right. You don't, you don't have to finish cleaning your room, or you don't have to finish that 20-minute timeout. My dick kids didn't have to sit in timeout that long, I promise. But timeout, or um, 
I just wanted to make it okay for them. I wanted, I wanted to see them smile again. And um, I knew that if I did that, and if I took that punishment away or said, oh, okay, you know, a couple minutes is enough, that they might not learn the lesson that they needed to learn. So I, I knew the importance of sticking with the consequences that we gave our kids for their, for their behavior. As I was reading my devotion one day this week, Romans 3.21 is what my devotion was about. So I'm going to read you 3.21 through 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So I, I, had, I, know, I knew what atonement was. You know, we've grown up in the church, and so I've heard that word. But I wanted to dig in a little more to what atonement meant. And the definition that I found was God pouring his wrath out on Jesus. Um, and another word your Bible might use is propitiation or mercy seat. And as I thought about those verses and related it to my parenting, I kept thinking about my own kids and having to pour my wrath out on my own children and how hard that had to be. But God did this for us, for my sin and for your sin. And it's the wrath that we deserve. Jesus didn't deserve it. He was perfect. It was a wrath that we deserved, but he poured it out on his one and only perfect son. Um, he declared Christ's death on the cross to be the appropriate sacrifice for our sin, and Jesus stood in our place to take our penalty. There's a song that came out I believe in the early 2000s, called In Christ Alone. And I want to read you a little portion of that song. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. I want you to get your communion out. As we take our communion this morning, I want you to think about the wrath that was poured out on Jesus, God's one and only perfect Son and that that wrath was for our sins. So as we take the bread together. And the juice that represents his blood. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the sacrifice that your Son made on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, our failures, our mess-ups, Lord. And um, I pray that we will never forget how blessed we are to have a God that would be willing to do that for us. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, so today I want to talk to you with our offering thought about change. And no, this is not change that I find in my pocket every day that I throw in a jar and I try to save for something else. This is the change that takes place in our lives every day. Maybe it's a change in a job. Uh, maybe it's a, a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's, it's the change of, of moving to a new place that, that you really don't know anything about like some of our families have. Change is hard. Uh, in the role that I have right now in my job, I have to change every single day. And a lot of times those people don't want to see change coming. Change is hard for everyone. Early Christians were no different. Uh, they always wanted to fall back on those Jewish practices that they knew uh, or the customs that they were comfortable with. But today, we as Christians are still, still fighting those struggles. We're trying, we're trying not to fall back into our ways. And we're trying to push through, but the only way we can do that is through genuine faith. Genuine faith in a Savior that saved our souls by giving His. Hebrews 13, 15-16 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others for such sacrifices, God is pleased. Today I want to challenge you. I challenge you to give in genuine faith, whether it's of your time, whether it's of your money, whether it's going out and professing His name. But I, I challenge you to give in genuine faith. At FCC, we've got a couple ways you can give to, to our different ministries, uh, and they're seen on the, on the screen. But I challenge you, and I know that you all will come through. This is a wonderful family of believers, and I believe in you. And at this time, just please bow with me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and worship. Lord, we ask that you be with Ben as he brings us the message from Hebrews. And, and Lord, we just ask that you open our hearts to his message. And ultimately, Lord, we, we thank you for the Savior that you sent that died on the cross for us that ultimately saved all our souls. In your name we pray. Amen. Morning, First Church. A couple things uh, before we get into the message that I uh, just kind of want to bring some attention to. As you're leaving today, out in the lobby, you'll see a table set up against the, the inside wall here brings attention to some missions that we do here at FCC. One in particular, uh, the Mexico trip that we've got a group that's getting ready to go on. I would encourage you guys to stop by there. Uh, talk to some of the people around that table and just learn a little bit as we got some different information and different things going on there. Uh, I would also like to give a, a tip of the cap to some of our youth group. Yesterday, they did a uh, Super Smash Bros tournament. Uh, over in, which just sounds cool, right? Like far cooler than me trying to say it. But they did that. Um, there was an entry fee to get into that, and all the proceeds, right at $400, went to Compassion International uh, to help out that mission. So super proud of them. Um, and listen, they... They put it together, they organized it, they pulled it off. It was, it was just an amazing thing. Uh, one more thing uh, before I get into the message. There is someone that's celebrating, I can't remember if it's either the 18th or her 88th birthday here today, but Miss Jackie Brandt is celebrating her 88th birthday today. Happy birthday, Miss Jackie. And it, it kind of bury the lead a little bit of spoiler alert. We're going to be talking a lot about encouragement today. But if you ever need encouragement, talk to Jackie Brandt. If you ever need somebody that's going, that you're wanting to pray for you and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that she is going to go before the throne of God for you on your behalf, talk to that lady right there. Amazing, amazing lady. We're going to start into our study of Hebrews. Uh, this year. I'm going to kind of be using some various passages, but Hebrews is one of those books that can be intimidating. It's one of the most mysterious 
and like one of the longest books in the New Testament. And we'll get to why I say mysterious here in just a little bit, but I want to provide us with an introduction this morning. But if I were to kind of surmise or give an overall theme to the book of Hebrews, it's this, that Jesus is greater, period. Jesus is greater, period. No matter how low the valley that you're in, Jesus is greater. No matter how much persecution and trial that you're in, Jesus is greater. No matter what type of mountaintop experience or victories that you're experiencing, Jesus is greater. You see, the early church was facing persecution And what the writer of Hebrews was doing, he was writing this letter to those who were facing such incredible adversity that they needed to be reminded that Jesus is greater than anything and everything that you could possibly face in this life. And the writer of Hebrews also encourages us to do the same. Encourage one another. I believe I speak for most of us in here. A word of encouragement is always well received. Amen? A word of encouragement is always well received. And can oftentimes be the difference in a horrible day, in a horrible season, in a horrible moment, to know that You have brothers and sisters. You have someone who is coming alongside of you and encouraging you. So we're going to take 30 weeks this year, on and off throughout the year, and we're going to study the book of Hebrews. We've spent the past couple years in, uh, I think it was the year of our Lord, was it 2021? We don't count 2020. Okay, it's just erased from history at this point. So time started again in 2021. But we started with the book of Ephesians. We spent 26 weeks in Ephesians. Last year, we did the book of Exodus. where We spent 28 weeks in the book of Exodus. And this year, we're doing Hebrews. And I'm, I'm going to say this. Um, and, and hear it out of all the love and the compassion that I can possibly present it with. The westernized church, the Americanized church in particular, is plagued with something called biblical illiteracy. Biblical illiteracy. And that's been one of the reasons, to be honest with you, that we have been taking the approach to these books that we have over the past few years. Because I will be the first to stand and tell you today, this morning, I am nowhere near as as literate as I need to be when it comes to the Bible. I need to dive into His Word more. I need to consume more. I need to study His Word more. Now understand that the Word of God isn't the only way that God speaks to us, but it is the primary way. And if, if you have your, and I'm not, I'm not doing this to, to, you know, bring attention or anything, but if you have a physical Bible with you, spoiler alert, there's some right there in front of you in the pew, should be. If you have it, lift it up in the air, please. What we're holding in our hand right here, and what you have on your device considering you're not already on social media, uh, what you have on your device, what we have is something that men and women of God for centuries before us yearned to have access to that we have. Right? Like, there, there have been times, the majority of time, as a matter of fact, to have this book to be able to be held in our hands was such an amazing privilege and something that men and women in the past either weren't allowed 
to do, or they didn't have access to it. And we've been gifted one of the greatest blessings that God could bless us with, with His Word being available to us. But yet, we do not give it the proper place in our life most of the time than what it should. You're guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. Because we're going to be talking about some things today, to be honest with you, that as believers, especially mature believers, we should already know. You should already, and some of you may already know that. But we're going to be challenged by the book of Hebrews, especially at the end of chapter 4, going into the beginning of chapter 5, of this maturing as a believer and getting off the milk and getting on to the meat. And since we're in Appalachia, taters too. So we got meat and taters. But I want to challenge you as we go through this time, don't neglect your Bible. Don't neglect His Word. Don't devalue that blessing that He has given you. And, and don't just depend on me to learn Scripture. Dive into it for yourself. I know that it's challenging. I know that we all are struggling at times with having availability and time available to us. But I find time to binge watch Netflix. Prime. I find time to mindlessly scroll social media. If I can find that, guess what else I have time for? To be in God's Word. So let's, let's look at a few things this morning. And, and keep in mind, as we go through the book of Hebrews, we need to understand that the Christians during the time that this was written weren't of a lofty social status. They would have been viewed as street people, basically. You see, we lose sight of this because we're sitting right now in a very beautiful building. We're sitting very comfortably. Climate controlled. For the most part, there's no threat. For us, we're meeting very safely here. And we look. There's plenty of men and women of influence, not only in our community, not only in our region, not only in our nation, but in our world, that proclaim the Christian faith. But it's not always been that way. And that's what the author of the letter of Hebrews is setting out to do, is addressing these people who are losing their homes. They've lost any source of income they can have. They're facing trials. They're facing persecution. They're facing all kinds of different things. They are even facing losing their life. And the author then goes on to say that I want you to encourage one another and makes themes throughout this entire book of how Jesus Christ is greater than anything and everything we'll experience in this life. So let's start with the authorship of Hebrews. Who wrote Hebrews? We don't know. Right? And if you think you know, guess what? You don't know. And trust me when I say that there have been men and women of God who are far smarter, far more intelligent than any of us sitting here, maybe all of us combined, that have tried to solve this question of the authorship of Hebrews. And they've not been able to do it. I don't know who wrote Hebrews. You can check with me 15 years from now, and I'm still not going to know what person wrote Hebrews. Number one, because I believe that's a mystery that God has hidden and to remain a mystery. Number two, I've got many other things that I can understand that I'm going to pursue those. There's all kinds of thoughts. Could be Paul, could be Peter, could be Barnabas. 
It would be Priscilla. It could be any of them. But here's what we know. As one theologian said, only God knows for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews because we certainly don't. But the important takeaway is the ultimate author of Hebrews is God himself. God, through his Holy Spirit, inspired this letter to be written. Now, when was it written? It was written in between the years of 64 and 69 A.D. And here's kind of how we can understand that time frame and why that's the most settled upon time frame amongst scholars. 70 A.D. is when the temple was destroyed. And there's no reference to that. Beyond even the reference of it, there are still several references in the book of Hebrews to the sacrificial system, which would have still been taking place at the temple. So we can put a cap on it at 69 AD. Now we can trace it back most likely to 64. Some people believe 60. That's not out of the realm of possibility. But 64 AD would give us a little bit of another insight into possibly maybe who the target audience was. Now we don't know exactly who the target audience was either. We know that it was written to converted Jews, to Jews who had converted to Christianity and Messianic belief. And we also know that there's really not a certain region that we can zoom into to understand that this is where, you know, because we know that the letter, um, you know, Paul's letter of Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. Romans was written to Rome. There's not a country named Hebrews. A lot of Christian coffee shops named Hebrews. Get it? He, Brews. He, Brews. Listen, I'm not saying we're the most creative folk in the world, all right? Just saying. But the reason that I believe that maybe this date of 64 AD and this 64 to 69 AD would give us a little bit of an inclination as to maybe a hint as to who it was written to, and if it wasn't written directly to them, it would have most definitely applied to them. Does anybody remember what happened in Rome in 64 AD? Aaron Baldwin. Do you remember what happened in 64 AD? I'm challenging his history knowledge here. He probably knows. It's a good answer. There was a big fire that took place in Rome that Nero set. You see, because Nero, terrible leader, fantastic showman, terrible leader, fantastic. He won. Anybody seen Emperor's New Groove? Come on now. I mean, yeah. Like when Kuzco wants to have his new summer place built, and he goes and he, he takes, wanting to take the hill. Nero wanted a bigger palace built. And what he did to make room for it was he set fire to Rome. But instead of taking blame, what did he do? He blamed the Christians. He said, they're the ones that's responsible to it. So we see maybe the most intense time frame of persecution and martyrdom within the early church right then, whenever Nero begins to persecute Christians as justice for their quote-unquote burning of Rome. And that takes us to a why it was written why it was written. We can see that it's written to exhort and to encourage. To exhort and encourage. Now, I'm going to be honest with you again. As I look at two books of the Bible that have truly intimidated me as to preaching through them, one of them is Romans. The other is Hebrews. Some people may ask, not Revelation? No. 
No, I don't worry about revelation. And here's what I'm, I'm going to quote a preacher named T.R. Williams. Advice he gave to one of his young students who was entering into the ministry, he said, allow the old men to preach revelation. Young men don't need to touch it because old men won't be alive long enough to realize how wrong they were. (laughs) But Romans and Hebrews, because they're so deep theologically, and they're beautiful, but to be honest with you, to stand up here and proclaim these deep theological truths and to go down all of those rabbit holes, it's intimidating. That is, that's got a, a gravity to it and a weight behind it. But when you look at the theme of Hebrews and you see that it is written, whether it's to the Roman church or not, when you see that it is written to believers who are living counterculturally and are beginning to suffer, they're beginning to be persecuted. They're beginning to face trials and tribulations. They have the entire world around them coming against them. And you see that the writer recognizes this and he says, or she says, whoever wrote it says, the one thing that I need you to focus on is that Jesus Christ is greater than anything you'll face. And can I speak that into your heart and into your life this morning that you may be facing persecution. You may be facing trial. You may be facing loss. You may be facing relational trial. You may be facing things that are coming at you from all angles, but church, hear me this morning that no matter what you're facing, Jesus Christ is greater. Period. And that is the hope that we have to cling on to. You know, our enemy. Does anybody, does anybody, here, we're going to date some of you here. There was a Domino's commercial back in the day. All right, it was an OG Domino's commercial. All right, it said, avoid the noid. Anybody remember that? Come on, come on, yeah, yeah. I can tell by your hairline and the color of your hair you remember it, all right? Okay, I'm there with you. We had a pastor one time who preached a sermon that used NOID as an acrostic, as an acronym. He, he said that you need to avoid the NOID, the nasty old intimidating devil. I thought that's the most Appalachian thing I've ever heard in my life. There's some glory into that. But we have an enemy. We have a foe that would love nothing more than for you to never, ever serve Jesus Christ. But the next best thing, if he can't stop you from doing that, the next best thing for him is for him to discourage you. For him to discourage you. And he'll take every opportunity he can to discourage you. He will manipulate you. He will manipulate your relationships. He will even manipulate what happens in here. He'll attempt to do that all that he doesn't want you living victoriously for Jesus Christ. For our enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come. Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life to the full. So what we face is not that different from what these Hebrew believers were facing that this letter was written to. Discouragement, loss, trial, pain, hopelessness, doubt, fear, despair. They faced all of that, and what the enemy was doing was he was serving to sever their relationship with Jesus Christ by removing their focus from Jesus Christ. And one of the worst things that we're going to discover as we go through this study that happens whenever our focus turns off of Jesus Christ is the term apostasy. We don't use that word a lot, and it basically means to abandon your faith or to step away from what you believe. 
Folks, let me, let me tell you something. If you ever get to the place that you're so discouraged and it's driving you away from this word and apostasy and that falling out is getting ready, you can feel it setting in, the cure for that is not to find truth elsewhere. The, tru- the cure for that is to ground yourself even further in the truth that you find in this book. We don't, we don't reaffirm our belief in the truth by seeking other truth. When the government trains people to be uh, agents that spot counterfeit currency, they don't send them out and have them study every counterfeit product known to man. No, they don't even put a counterfeit in front of them until the end of the training. What do they do? They put the real thing in front of them. And they say, we want you to study this. We want you to memorize this. We want you to know this so well, back and front, that you can spot something that's fake simply by knowing so well the real thing. And that's the same thing we need to do. Because the enemy will discourage us, and there will be times that we will question our faith. Amen? Let's just be real. There, will be, there have been times in most of your lives, I'm sure, where you have questioned, am, am, am I really doing the right thing? Like, is, this really, is this really the right thing? We see John the Baptist face this situation. right? He was the one that was responsible and extremely obedient and committed to his mission of making making known making straight the path proclaiming that the messiah was coming the ones who would redeem us the one that would save us the one that would set the prisoner free and yet john the baptist sitting in a prison cell sends his disciples to Jesus, the one that he had proclaimed, the one that he had baptized, the one that he had said, that's him. That's the man who comes to take away the sin of the world. He said, go ask him if he's really that guy. Right? It's like, go ask him. Like he had given his whole life, was willing to lay down his life, was currently in a prison cell, and he began to doubt. Why? Why? Because where he was, in his mind, contradicted his message of setting the prisoner free. See, it's not unusual when we find ourselves in places to where we begin to doubt and have questions about, is this really what's happening? Is this really the will of God? Did I just say that was willy the will of God? Willy to will. I, Elmer Fudd quote, insert that there. But when we begin to question if it is really the will of God or not, in prayer and in the Word. That's your prescription. Take it twice daily, at least. But let's look at what the writer of Hebrews tells us, because this is a book while deep and rich in beautiful doctrine and theology, on the surface, it is a simple message of exhortation and encouragement. And one of the writer's favorite statements is, let us. Let us. So let's look. I'm going to, I'm going to read some of these for you here. So let's look at the let us statements. We're going to start with uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 11. Uh, Verse 1, Let us fear, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Then he kind of comes along in verse 11 of the same chapter and kind of undergirds that. He says, Let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall. He continues with let us statements. In 4.16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Let us press on to maturity. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Do you see what he's addressing here? That apostasy, that falling away, that abandoning the faith. He's saying, hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then let us show gratitude. I I think there's something in all of us right there that we need to show more gratitude for what we have. Amen? Amen. Let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. And now here's one passage that I really want us, uh, I'm going to take just a few moments and focus in on it. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, and we're going to talk about encouragement. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. There's references in like Hebrews 10, 32 through 35, where it talks about that if we're in prison together, if we're prisoners together for Christ's sake, then we need to encourage each other in our imprisonment. Then in Hebrews 13, 15, it says that if you're not in prison, but you have fellow believers that are in prison, encourage them, pray with them, be with them, just as though you are in prison also. We are called to encourage one another. Encourage one another this day while it is still today. Now, I'm going to ask the praise team. They've got a really special treat for us this morning. So I'm going to ask them to come back up. Jesus has commanded us to be salt and to be light. Folks, if you're following Jesus Christ, we have a light to shine And it's not only a light to shine in darkness. It is that. Amen? We are to shine a light in darkness. But we are also called to shine the light in each other's lives by encouraging each other. Everyone, get your lights out. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan it out, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Shine all over the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. Shine all over the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. Shine all over the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right. All right, so they had their turn. Now it's your turn. I'm not going to have you sing. But we are commanded. It's not an option of if you have time or if you have the opportunity or if you feel like it to encourage one another while it is called today. It's commanded. 
encourage this day, one another, while it is still today. So what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to take a couple minutes, and I'm going to ask you whether it's your neighbor or if it's somebody all the way across or upstairs, you know, the balcony dwellers need encouragement, all right? But I want you to just go to someone, speak a word of encouragement, and if, you, if you're confused as to what that is, just let them know that you love them. Let them know you're praying for them. Just encourage one another. So I want to ask you to stand to your feet. I want to ask you to take a couple minutes, mingle about, and encourage each other. All right, going to give you about one more minute, folks. One more minute. I appreciate you. All right, folks, if you will, go ahead and be making your way back to your seat. All right, guys. Hey, did, does, does it feel good to be encouraged? Does it feel good to be encouraged? Yeah, don't, uh, don't wait to be prompted to do that. Don't wait to be prompted. And whether you know the person or not, encourage them. Say a kind word. And if you do know the person, if it's within this family and you know that they're struggling, you know that they're going through something difficult, Take the time and just say a simple encouraging word because we are to encourage each other this day while it is still today. Now, I'm going to ask, I know that um, you know, it's kind of a little different than what we have normally done before, but I'm going to ask those that I've asked to serve on the prayer team this morning to go ahead and, and come on up and be available this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, then I would encourage you to come and surrender your hearts to the Lord. If you're here and you just need encouragement, you just want somebody to pray with you, then I ask that you come forward this morning as we stand and as we sing. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are 
good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, let the king of my heart be the wind and tell myself the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire and tell my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good oh seated for just a few moments. Most of you know, but for those of you who don't, this is David and Janie Messer. They have been uh, coming here. Uh, they've moved down from the balcony today, so <laughs> apparently they're here to give their heart to the Lord. No, I'm just, I'm playing. I'm playing. Um, they've been coming here for a while. We've been absolutely blessed to, uh, to have them here with us. And they've come forward today to officially put in their membership here at First Church of Christ. Yeah. So they are, uh, they are most definitely already baptized believers. Uh, so, but I'm just going to ask uh, that you all would just repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the risen God. The Son of the risen God. Yeah, amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Make sure, make sure that you see them after service really quickly and, and welcome them and congratulate them. Uh, just really quickly, we have uh, a young lady here who would uh, like to say a, a few words regarding our food pantry. Since many of you are um, new to the church, new to the church, I'm thinking last five or ten years, uh, many of you don't know we have a food pantry. Many of you have never seen the food pantry, and you have never seen the people that come through that line asking for food. Uh, last month, in December, we served 200 families at the food pantry. This month it was down a little bit because of the weather, I guess, and we served between 140 and 150. Um, we have a good bunch of workers. If you have worked at the food pantry, I'd like you to stand up. 
stand up if you worked at the food pantry. <laughs> and I'm not asking you, I'm telling you to stand up. Now, there's a lot more than the, those men in the back didn't stand up, but they should have. They don't want you to know that they do good works, do you? But they do. We could never have done without that group of men that came uh, to work with us. Because most of us that worked at the food pantry, we were getting a bit, oh, a touch old, just a touch. And we had a lot of food to carry in that we've ordered. And um, we got to the place we just, it was too much for us to carry it in. And some of the uh, men of the church volunteered, and not just of this church, volunteered to come and help us unload that food. We could never have done it without them. I'm going to mention some. I'm afraid I'll forget somebody, so if I do, you just yell at me. Uh, Mike Johnson, uh, Gary McDowell, um, Jason James. Is anybody else here that I didn't mention? We also had people coming. We had about 10 to 12 yesterday over the last two days, Thursday and Friday, that came from other churches. People coming, I don't think we have anybody from the Catholic Church now, but we did have people from the Catholic Church, from the Presbyterian Church, from the Baptist Church, and of course from this church. Uh, from, uh, I'm not sure where this couple's from. Uh, they're either from Willard or from, does anybody know where they're from? Where? Anyway, another church, and there's probably one I have no idea, even if she goes to church, but she's there. Um, we spend approximately, oh, I want to say something else first. Two people that are priceless in this endeavor. Jim Scott. Do you know Jim Scott? Uh, do you know Steve Kyber? They are completely priceless in this endeavor. Is Bonnie in here right now? No. Well, I was going to repeat something she told me, but I'll do the best I can with it. We had this line coming through, and this fellow was coming through. Probably, if you met him on the street, you crossed to the other side, okay? Um, he didn't say this to me. But Bonnie was at the end of the line. He said to her, he said, I don't know what I would have eaten tonight. So this is what we deal with. We do need money. I don't know how much. I'm not up here to ask you for money. But if you want to give some, we certainly would appreciate it. Um, this does not function without money. You know how much it costs you to go to the store for one family? Imagine going to the, school, to the store for 200 families or 150 families. And I, I felt a little bit bad because I feel like the people of the church don't know and don't appreciate. We would love for you to come um, and just watch us. Um, we really can't use all that many workers because it has to derive many from other churches. But I would like for you all to come and see what's happening. I don't think you know what's happening. And if you want to know where there is an audience of people who need Jesus and need you, I can tell you exactly where you can find them and I have schedules when you can find them. Okay? That's all I have to say. I don't know how many of you had Ms. Phillips for school and in class. Well, she said, stand up. She stood up. She stood up before she was even saying it. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you for all you do for our, for our church, for this community. It's greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am going to ask Devin, if he would, to come now. He's going to do our announcements and dismissal prayer. He's going to remind you of something that's happening right after service as well. 
Amen. I just, uh, one thing I just love to see, just the fellowship, the encouragement that went forth, just right there. It's such a blessing to see connections. You know, it's easy to come into church and stay disconnected. So thank you for reaching out and making connections. I think that's so important. So our annual meeting, um, where we're going to talk about like uh, deacons or finance and stuff like that. So that'll be right after. There'll be a little bit of a break. So if you want to hear about that, uh, come on into the service. Um, the youth group's going to be going to uh, Perfect North, and that's going to be on February 4th. It's going to go at 8 a.m. If you need information about that, please contact Thomas. Just reach out to Thomas. Uh, this week, as we're getting ready for Valentine's coming up on February 14th, there's going to be a lot of emails for a lot of groups, whether it's seniors or whether it's high school or younger. It's going to be going. So just keep pay attention to uh, your computers this week or your phone or wherever your emails are at. Um, our children's ministry is going to be served at the Huntington City Mission. And that's going to happen on February 18th. Exciting. They're going to learn about practical service. One of the things I love, again, about this church is that our youth are also learning how to reach out and be involved, not just in their tight little circles where everything's cool. So I re if you need to see about, uh, if you're interested in that or want to find out, please contact Mandy about that. There's going to be evening fellowship, which includes the youth group. Groups. We're also going to be watching The Chosen. If you haven't seen that, that is awesome. I encourage you to come on tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, with that, let's close out in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you. We bless you that you are the one who is the greatest encourager, the one who comes alongside of us, the one who lifts us up and then tells us to just pass on what you've been given to us. So we just ask that you would bless Lord God, bless this congregation, bless these families, and we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.